Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Let's get started. Uh, my name is Becky and I'm going to be chairing the call this evening. So first, before we kick off properly, some housekeeping. Um, so do carry on introducing yourselves in the chat and put any questions that you've got along the way in there as well. We've got two British Sign Language interpreters with us here tonight. And I just want to say a big thank you in advance to both of them, to Ali and to Lauren. Um, and we also have closed captioning uh, for those who need it. So if you turn this on, there should be like a live transcript button um, at the bottom of your screen. And if you press that, you should be able to access um, the transcript. Um, if everyone could be aware that there are deaf people and people with hearing difficulties on the call. So if there are times when there's discussion going on, just please try and make sure that only one person is talking at any one time for the sake of clarity and so the interpreters don't get exhausted. Um, and if you have any issues with BSL or the transcript or anything else, if you could just use the chat box to direct message Fergal at NEF um, and we'll get back to you or someone will get back to you and try and help you. So lastly, um, please do tweet along with this evening uh, using the hashtag living income. I'm Becky Winson. I'm a senior organiser at NEF at the New Economics Foundation, and I am really excited to be leading this campaign launch today. The UK is in the grip of an inequality crisis. Over 20 million people in the UK will be living below an acceptable standard of living by November. I just want everyone to pause and let that sink in for a second. That is nearly a third of our population. The benefit system that we have is causing and entrenching poverty. And I've got firsthand experience of how inadequate the social security system is. The years I was on what was then Job Seekers Allowance were some of the toughest of my life. And I've seen loads of my friends and family suffer firsthand the cruelty and inadequacy of the current system since. And I'm sure many of you on the call this evening um, have, have had that experience too. And that isn't just bad for those of us in need of benefits, it's bad for all of us. Inequality and poverty fracture families, communities and society. They cause and worsen public health crises and they demolish local economies. And all of that makes us weaker as a country. Without a living income, we will find it increasingly difficult to solve many of the problems we're all facing today. So I'm excited that we're all here today together because this needs fixing, but I'm also excited to be here because I know it can be fixed. So the living income is achievable and there is a growing consensus that the benefit system needs to be progressively reformed. There's councils and regional authorities up and down the UK who've called for the ability to implement local basic income or living income pilots. The Scottish government has just finished a feasibility study on implementing a pilot scheme there. And other nations are already doing their benefit systems differently and have been for so time, some time. The UK is not the most generous at the benefit system that we like to paint ourselves as. Italy, Germany, France and others aren't just outstripping us on the football field, or they will be in a few weeks time, sorry. Um, but they're already outstripping us in terms of how supportive they are of their citizens. Their benefit systems are many times more plentiful than ours. So we can do things another way. So why hasn't it happened already? Well, that's why we're here tonight. What is missing? What is the one thing that hasn't happened amongst all the studies and pilots and discussion is wide scale organised public pressure for the measures that we know are needed. A living income, just like any other sort of change, will not happen at the whim of any politician. It will happen when people come together and demand it. So what's missing in short is you and us and all of us here this evening. We're gonna get planning the first steps in building that power tonight. But first of all, we're gonna hear from some really great speakers. So first up, we're gonna hear from Miata Farnbilla, who's CEO at NEF. Then we're gonna hear from Ella Clifford of Disabled People Against Cuts. And then we'll hear from Andy Burnham, Mayor of Greater Manchester. We'll also hear from two of our campaign supporters, Chris and Sylvia. Before I give Miata the floor, I just want to ask all speakers to pay attention to what I'm about to say next. It's really important that we stick to time tonight. 
So as you're speaking, just try to keep an eye on me on the Zoom window. When you've got about 30 seconds left, I'll put one of my hands up. And when you're out of time and you need to wrap up, I'll put both of my hands up. And if you go way over, I'll start making completely different hand gestures and you don't want that. If you're not speaking, I am all about redistributing power. So I will share one bit of my chairing with those who want to share it. If the speaker doesn't appear to have heard me and I've got both my hands up, just stick both your hands up as well. So it just draws attention to the fact they need to wrap things up. So I will now hand over to Miata. Miata is going to talk to us about what the problems are that a living income would solve and give some more information about what the living income is. So Miata, over to you. Thanks so much, Becky. Uh, first, can I just say a massive thank you to everyone for joining us for the launch of this living income campaign tonight. Um, I hope that this is going to be the start of many of us working together to try and make this a reality. Uh, and I just wanted to say a few words about why I and we believe uh, that we urgently need this. Um, and then the work that we want to try and do together in order to push this up the political agenda. So, look, I think it's clear for everyone to see that the pandemic is being accompanied by an economic crisis, the scale of which we have not seen for generations. And it is a crisis that's shining a massive spotlight on deep seated problems that were there anyway with our economy, from the weakness of our social protections through to deep inequalities in our society. And for me, no more so, no brighter light shone on the squeeze in incomes that we have combined with the sheer inadequacy of our social security system. You know, we entered this pandemic with living standards having pretty much flatlined since 2008. So that meant many people went into this pandemic already eating hand to mouth, paycheck to paycheck with very little cushion to weather the storm. And then the pandemic came along and it has blown this up massively. And, you know, Becky talked about it. The research that we've published today shows that by this autumn, nearly one in three households, 21.4 million people will be living on an income in which they are struggling to stay afloat and can't afford day-to-day -day necessities like putting food on the table, heating their homes, buying clothes for their kids. And even more shocking, 45% of all children will be living in households on an income where they can't afford the basics for a decent quality of life. Nearly half of all of our children, how on earth have we got to this place? I know even if the government keeps the 20 pound uplift universal credit, which it's threatening to take away, the picture is just as stark. And the problem is spread across the country with the highest proportions of people living below a decent income in London, in the Northeast, in the Northwest. And then at the very time when so many people need a social safety net more than ever, the sheer inadequacy of our social security system, I think has been exposed. You know, we entered this pandemic with one of the weakest social security safety nets, both amongst advanced economies and in our own post-war history. So total out-of-work payments received by people in this country are on average 34% of their previous in-work income. That's the third, the third lowest amongst the 35 OECD advanced economies. And it's worth less than at any time since the 1948 creation of the welfare state. But what gives me hope is I think, you know, the vulnerabilities, the weaknesses, the problems that have been exposed by this crisis, I think are forging a new consensus for the need for change. The polling suggests that there is strong public appetite not to revert back to business as usual. And attitudes to things like social security are shifting with more of the public believing social security payments are far too low and that the welfare system needs to be more generous. So I think there is space to win public support, to build pressure, to build momentum for this basic principle that there should be an income in which we say as a society, no one is allowed to fall below 
so that everyone can afford the basics for a decent quality of life, a living income, if you like, delivered by building an adequate income floor within our social security system. Now, look, for me, this isn't radical. It's not revolutionary stuff. It's basic. And it cannot be beyond the wit of the sixth richest country in the world in order to do this. And the fact, the fact that it feels like such a stretch to achieve it, in my view, shows how far we have fallen and how much we are letting people down. But like Becky, I, Becky, I believe that we can win this, but I'm absolutely clear and I know that we cannot do this unless we try and build a powerful alliance, a movement, raise our voices collectively and work together to win the hearts and the minds of the public on the need for this and then push it up the political agenda. And that's why we're asking everyone here in this virtual room, I wish we were together, but we're virtually together, to get involved in the campaign for a living income in your communities. And if we pull this off, we will have the chance of winning the sort of big profound change that we need in order to right the wrongs of an economy that simply does not work for people and create the foundations for a new social settlement coming out of this horrific pandemic. Look, moments like this, they come once in a few generations. And so we have to do everything that we can to win this. We've got to do everything that we can to build back better so that there is light at the darkness of this horrendous pandemic. Thank you. Thanks, Miata. Um, not too much over time at all, so that's great. Um, okay, so next up, uh, we're going to hear from Ellen Clifford. Um, Ellen is on the National Steering Group of Disabled People Against Cuts, and she's also the author of The War on Disabled People, Capitalism, Welfare and the Making of a Human Catastrophe, and that's published by Zed Books. Um, so, uh, Ellen, um, have we got Ellen on the call? Here we yeah. go, there's Ellen. Okay, over to you, Ellen. Thanks, Becky. So Disabled People Against Cuts, DPAC, are really delighted to have been invited to be part of today's launch for a campaign for a living income. And I have to say, we did push, we did push them quite hard when they invited us at first to make sure that there's a genuine interest in working with disabled people and thinking about disability related factors particularly in work around social security, given that disabled people are statistically much more likely to be reliant on benefits, whether we're in or we're out of work. And given the fact that prior to March 2020, disabled people made up 68% of the benefit caseload. And obviously they passed the test, which is why I'm here today. But also because the question of a living income resonates so strongly for disabled people. Before the coalition government came to power in 2010, disabled people were twice as likely to live in poverty as other people. And then now, according to the Equality and Human Rights Commission, EHRC, we're three times more likely to live in severe material deprivation. The cum cumulative assessment of tax and welfare changes that the EHRC carried out found that the more disabled you are, the harder you were hit by the cumulative impact of those changes. According to the Centre for Welfare Reform, disabled people were hit nine times harder than non-disabled people by austerity and welfare reform. But for disabled people with high support needs, that figure rose to 19 times harder. And according to the EHRC again, disabled lone parents with disabled children were due to lose £10,000 from their annual income by 2021. And I know you'll all be familiar with those awful stories of welfare reform victims that are covered in the mainstream media, given that in the words of journalist, disabled journalist Francis Ryan, death has become an everyday part of our benefit system. Stories like that of Errol Graham, the grandfather from Nottingham who died of starvation when his benefits were cut off. Or Jodie Whiting, disabled mother living with mental distress who took her own life 
days after her benefits were stopped because she was so seriously ill she'd missed an appointment. But what the mainstream media doesn't cover is how these benefit related deaths and suicides are part of a much broader social injustice that exists within the system that we live under. These deaths and suicides aren't just unfortunate errors. They're symptomatic of a very deliberate ideological agenda, one that prioritizes the interests of business and profit above the needs of the working class. The social security system we have now doesn't provide a genuine safety net, as Miata and Becky have said. And that's also evidenced by the fact that the government had to uprate universal credit at the start of the pandemic by 20 pounds a week. And even then, it still only represents 44% of the minimum income standard that's needed for an acceptable standard of living. For the 2.2 million people still on legacy benefits, three quarters of whom are disabled, of course, there wasn't any uplift. And that's despite the fact that disabled people's unavoidable expenditures, so disabled people face um, increased costs as a direct um, result of our impairments and, and illnesses. And according to Scope, on average, that's £583 per month unavoidable expenditure. But those costs went up significantly as a direct result of having to shield. So people who, who were shielding obviously had additional costs, such as PPE for staff, uh, higher energy costs, costs of online deliveries. Many disabled people are frontline workers in low paid insecure jobs, um, and they just simply couldn't afford to shield. Over the past decade, we've experienced a deliberate attempt to make the social security system much harder to access, to make it more punitive, um, more hostile towards claimants, to make it more insecure through this constant uh, round and regime of distressing benefit assessments. And that can be directly linked to conditions in the workplace that have also become harder, labour's intensified, wages have stagnated or decreased, insecurities risen, less autonomy and greater standardisation. Research shows that low paid, low control jobs are actually worse for your mental health than being unemployed. So by making life on benefits unbearable with payments at inadequate levels, it ensures there's still a supply of workers, however bad the jobs are getting. So what we need is a radically different system, a social security system that actually puts the needs of people who need the payments, the social security payments first, regardless of how close or far we are from the labor market. And that doesn't mean simply going back to beverages settlement because let's not forget that disabled people were deliberately left out of that settlement. Beveridge was a eugenicist. He was a member of the Eugenic Society. He believed the whip of starvation was needed to prevent malingering. And that's why he didn't believe in disability benefits. So we don't wanna go back to that. We want to build and go further and make something better. And what we need is a fundamentally different system from what we've got now. One that's based on trust in people, on ideas that value people, regardless of our productive capacity within a highly standardized labor market, on a celebration of diversity, on the fostering of independence as the hallmark of a collective society founded on principles of justice, equality, and inclusion. And we have a long way to go before we can win that kind of society. But for day, today, I would urge you all to support this campaign for a living income. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ellen. That was really great. Um, it was really, really good to hear from you. And, um, and thanks for being with us here tonight. Um, so next up, we're going to go to Andy Burnham. Um, Andy is the mayor of Greater Manchester, and uh, he's going to talk to us tonight um, about uh, what difference a living income would make uh, in Greater Manchester. And um, Andy, over to you. Oh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Becky. Good evening, everybody. Fantastic to be with you all. A living income for all. That seems to me to be a clarion call for our time. So well done to everybody for the New Economics Foundation <clears throat> for bringing us all together uh, this evening. Miata, you spoke brilliantly. Ellen, so did you just now. Some of what you said actually is, is actually shocking. And we don't dwell on it enough, how shocking what you've just said is in terms of the way disabled people uh, are treated by the system. And yeah, this is the moment to get a bit angrier about it and actually be more demanding of the change that we need 
to see, before I get into what I wanted to say, I just want to kind of turn people's kind of minds back to February 2020. I was in London for the launch of Michael Marmot's 10-year review. So Michael, as many people on this call will know, world expert in health inequalities. In February 2010, he presented to me his groundbreaking report on health inequalities when I was the health secretary. Now, as you'll remember, we weren't ar around long enough as a government to do anything about it. 10 years on, he then presented an update and he, and he asked me to come to the launch of it in, in London. And basically what he said in the 10 years between 2010 and 2020, we had seen such an erosion in people's uh, incomes, as you were saying, Becky, at the start, and that's been a process that's been ongoing, but it's not just income, an erosion of people's security, because that's important too, isn't it? The, the lack of security over income levels, which damages people's mental health. And then, of course, the knock-on impacts of that on people's housing and their lack of uh, security of housing. And, and he said, February 2020, pre-pandemic, that for the first time in 100 years, life expectancy in England had stalled for the first time in a century and actually had gone backwards amongst women in some of the poorest parts of the north of England because women had been the most affected by the move towards a more insecure, low-paid labour market. Now, that was the month before. And actually, as Miata said, everything we've experienced said has kind of shone a brutal spotlight on what Michael Marmot was saying and has exacerbated all of the things that he identified. We have seen over the last um, uh, 14, 16 months how there are millions of people in this country who do not earn enough and do not have sufficient security of income to be able to protect their own health. So when they have been symptomatic or been requested to self-isolate, they have been simply unable to do so because they would not have been able uh, to live had they uh, tried uh, to do so. We heard from Unison in the Northwest at the start of the pandemic, who said that 80% of care assistants here feared that they wouldn't be able to self-isolate if asked to do so because they knew that terms of employment would not result in them being paid. Now, that is, when, when you then look at what's happened over the last uh, year or so, and I always get this here where people say, why is it always Greater Manchester with the high case rates? Well, you have your explanation there, don't you? That there are so many people whose work situation, housing situation simply does not allow them to have the basics of a good, of a good life. And that's what this is about, isn't it? You need a, a basic income and a good secure home to have a good life to have good health. If you do not have those things, you will not have a good life and you will not have good health. Why in this day and age are we accepting the situation where so many of our fellow citizens cannot have good health? 70 plus years on from the creation of the NHS, it's a scandal actually that we're allowing people's health to be destroyed in this way, but particularly their mental health. And that is the issue I think of these, these times, the lack of income security, housing security, chips away at people's mental health and well-being. And that is why, as well as a pandemic, we have a mental health crisis uh, unfolding around us. Uh, a pandemic happening on many levels, actually, not just COVID, uh, but, a, but a pandemic of, of mental uh, health as, as well. So that's why it is the clarion call <clears throat> for our times. And Becky, let's get it to a more positive uh, position before I, before I finish. What I have learned in my time as mayor of Greater Manchester, particularly through my work on homelessness, is if you set people up to fail, they will. But if you set people up to succeed, well, well actually, they will succeed. We have a scheme here called Housing First, which gives people who've been sleeping rough a, a home without any pressure upon them in terms of um, the time that they've got that home. It gives them space to recover. And it's an amazing thing to see that so many people sustain their tenancies it's a really successful project. And what that has taught me is, if you set people up to succeed, they will. And you set people to, up to succeed in life by giving them the basic income that they need, that everybody needs to live on, so that then they can have that secure home, which is the foundation for everything in life. And to those politicians 
who are not just on the right of politics, some of them are to be found on in, in the Labour Party as well, who say, oh, well, it's just un unaffordable, we can't afford it. Actually, if you look at the experience from Finland, from other parts of Scandinavia, if you set people up to succeed in life by giving them the firm foundations beneath them of a decent income and a good home, you will actually spend less on crisis public services that are constantly picking up the pieces where people get passed from pillar to post and no one quite solves the solution, the issue that people have. A basic income for everybody, a living in income for everybody sets people up to succeed. And that is what we should be calling for coming out of this pandemic. We have seen thousands, millions of people are not set up to succeed. They are not set up to have good health. And if, if anything, this moment is one to say, we demand it actually for all of our residents. And this call from the New Economics Foundation needs to be taken into the, the public inquiry that will be coming on the pandemic afterwards. And we need to make this argument now around good health for everybody, which requires a basic income uh, and, and secure housing. And if we're ever going to, to do it and win it, then I would say clearly the time the time is now. This is a movement that I am proud to be part of. Here in Greater Manchester, we have said we will be a pilot area for universal basic income. Bring it on. Please get behind us. We would be delighted to pilot it uh, here. We've seen in Finland how moves in this direction do massively improve people's uh, mental health. We, we will be making the right arguments at the right time. The public have seen that there have been people out there in the last year keeping the place running in shops, in care homes, in other walks of life that aren't paid enough to live on. They don't even get a real living wage. And I think the country is with this argument. Those who keep the place going need to at least to have enough to live on. That's an argument that we can win uh, with you know, everybody pulling together in this direction. We will win it. Thanks for having me on this call tonight. I'm absolutely fired up by what you are, what you are doing. All of Greater Manchester, I think I can speak for Pretty much all of it, because I've got a pretty good election result recently. So there's a lot of people with, with with what we're doing at the moment. You know, they're all with you in this campaign and uh, we will play our full part in it. So well done uh, to everyone uh, for being part of this. And I'll hand back to you, uh, Becky. Amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Ellen. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, Ellen, I just have to say thank you for the amazing work that you're doing. Um, the, the sort of statistics you gave on the impacts of some of the changes of social security on people with disabilities is sobering. Um, it, it, you know, Andrew's right, we should be getting angry about it. Um, and if I wasn't motivated before, which I was, I'm like doubly motivated and just really excited to be working with you on this campaign. Andy, thank you for being such a leading, powerful voice on this. Um, you know, th that, that, basic point you made, a basic income, a decent housing is the foundations that people need for a good life. It's as simple as that. It is as simple as that. And so thank you for the leadership. Thank you for putting Greater Manchester with a call to be a pilot at the heart of this. Uh, you know, we want other political leaders. We know we can't win this unless we have voices as powerful as yours, speaking as passionately as and powerfully as you are um, about this campaign, about why this is important. And so we hope you're up for working with us to get other Metro mayors, other leaders uh, across local government to lend their voices to this campaign so they can be part of building and pushing the movement that can create the pressure for this to happen. Lots to play for, lots to work for. Um, and I'm really fired up and I'm really excited. Over to you, Becky. Thanks so much, Miata, um, and thanks, Andy, and thanks, Ellen. Um, it was a really great way to kick the meeting off. Um, we're going to go over now to um, two supporters of the campaign, um, to Sylvia and to Chris. So they're going to talk about um, why it is they support the living income and some of the experiences they've had that, that have led them to that. Um, so first up, uh, we're going to have Sylvia Vuzden. Um, so Sylvia is a carer and benefits claimant and as she introduced herself in the chat earlier, she is from Reading, just up the road from me. So hi Sylvia, um, over to you. You're on mute Sylvia. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. So 
uh, Andy Burnham, uh, you know, it's it's um, it's great that yeah he's making moves, but I think um, one of the things that we have to get away from, which is all over the media and across the, uh, across the political spectrum, is the idea of deserving and undeserving poor. Because it seems to it, you know, so it and the, because for me the whole benefit system is um, is designed to punish you if uh, if you can't or or, um, or, or you, you don't have the um, the mental health or the or the ability to work. Um, so and, and this one size everything is black and white and it's a one size fits all, and often that isn't that 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 it uh, doesn't allow for individuality. It doesn't allow for individual circumstances, and it doesn't allow uh, for, for the possibility that you might have men you might look physically well, but have mental health problems that would uh, that would make it difficult for you to to take up regular employment. Um, I have I'm I'm going to I've been asked to talk about my own personal experience of benefits, and uh, I had um, I had an illness. Um, that meant that uh, I, I had to have a couple of operations on my leg and I tried to claim um, employment support allowance and was refused and had to fight for seven months. And in the meantime, before going to court, in the meantime, um, I had was served with an eviction notice because I couldn't afford my rent. Um, I had the real possibility of being thrown on the streets with my teenage son and my mental health suffered. Um, I became depressed, uh, anxious um, as the time went on. I was also couldn't walk, I couldn't work. And, um, and two days before the uh, court case, they decided I could have the money. And the first thing I did was pay the rent so I didn't end up on the street. But I, I just, um, but if, if there had been, um, there have been the, the the ability to actually uh, be able to 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 at least have some kind of income while we're while while the um, while the whole process was going on. I wouldn't my mental health wouldn't have suffered <laughs> so quite so much. Um, when Andy Vernon talks of um, basic needs, I think he's talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. When I was at university, we we did this as part of the nursing course uh, that you have to have the basics of food, shelter, warmth, before you can develop and grow as a human being and actually meet your full potential. You need the basics. And if without those, you can't move on and you can't grow and develop. Um, as I said, uh, uh, across the political spectrum, um, there is this um, idea that some people deserve um, more than others. Uh, Rachel Reeves, I think, said that the Labour Party wasn't the party of benefit claimants, which is very irritating when you consider that two out of three people claiming benefits are actually working. So it's, um, it, I don't think, you don't feel that the whole benefit system is there with you. You feel that they're set up against you and you have so many barriers to being able to claim. I, um, I, it took me three hours to claim universal credit. You need a government gateway account. You need a driving license or a passport. You need, <laughs> the, um, and you need uh, access to the internet. You need to be able to, I mean, if you went to the library, you only get one hour on, on a computer at the library. If, if it's open, it's not a minute. Um, so how are you supposed to access benefits if you're not connected to the internet? How are you supposed to be able to, um, and all, all, the, all the time, if you go into uh, a, a job center, they, was, they tell you to go home and apply online. It's, you know, it's, um, they do have computers there, but it's, but yeah, you, you have to wait. And not every, you know, so, and so there are a lot of people who have other commitments. They can't, they can't spend all day um, at the job center. So, so yes, um, I'm rambling a bit, but. <laughs> But I just, I, I, um, I used to uh, work at Communicare, uh, which is uh, behind the Whitcliffe um, Church. There is, a, there is 
uh, an advice centre and I used to help people uh, claim benefits and be able to access um, the, th the things they deserve. And a lot of carers came in. And I think one of the things that we have to think about, because I, I read th uh, somewhere that um, carers actually save the government something like 19 billion pounds a year by looking after relatives that would otherwise have to be um, to, uh, to be looked after by the state. So why can't we at least increase carers allowance or, or recognize that people who, who, are, who are helping, um, who are looking after their relatives are actually contributing to society, even if they're not- actually... I'm really sorry. I'm gonna to have to ask you to wrap up. Um, yeah. just bit, I've been but, a bad um, chair and not kept an eye on the time. So if you could just- Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, there's lots of, the, I mean, I'm, uh, one of the things that, uh, just, just, just a, a site mentioned there's that there, um, I, th I think anyone who is, is actually making up policies for poor people should actually know exactly what they're talking about and actually know and actually consult people who are in poverty before they start making those policies. That's about it, really. <laughs> Sylvia, yeah, thank you. That was really that was really great, and it is it is my fault that um, we went over time slightly, not yours, and it was all really powerful stuff. And I just want to say thanks for for you sharing that with us. Um, so yeah, thanks to Sylvia and you were getting a lot of appreciation in the chat. So um, <gasps> I saw some of it. Um, so next up, we're going to hear from Chris, uh, Chris Lynch. Um, Chris is from the Wirral and Chris, I believe you work in mental health care provision. Is that right? My notes are unclear, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing more on a voluntary basis. Great. Well, I will hand over to you and we'll hear a bit more about why you support the Living Income campaign. Thanks very much. Thank you. So I'm Chris. I'm really passionate about helping secure a living income for everyone for a number of reasons. So over the last 25 years, I've earned minimum wage for the majority of that time. And for a few years, I've earned average wage and a couple of little periods I've managed to earn um, average wage. And that's had such a profound difference you know, on, on my health, my well-being, you know, the different types of food I can afford to eat, just the, the reducing in stress, you know, the ability to relax, exercise, rather than just constantly worrying. So I've worked in hospitality most of my life, you know, and, and, and I see the effects of having non-guaranteed hours, you know, a rising trend sort of 10 years ago was people, more people doing two jobs, now people are doing three jobs, you know, just to make ends meet. You know, and I see the effect that has on, you know, their health, their well-being, you know, on their relationships, on their family, you know, and their ability to contribute to society. Personally, as well, I've struggled with my mental health since childhood. Um, for the first sort of 20 years, I very much felt like a passive recipient. But about 12 years ago, I accessed peer support. And for me, it, it was life changing. And for the last 10 years, I've helped run peer support groups and a user-led mental health charity. And what we find is that a lot of people coming in, you know, for support, as soon as they get um, an assessment for benefits or a reassessment or an appeal, it can often um, be more detrimental than, than why they came in the first place. And that constant cycle just keeps people unwell, you know, sort of having five years to get better rather than constantly being reassessed and people just might get a bit better and then fall back down. And, and having to go through that on such low income, we see people, you know, that the, some people might just about manage in the summer, but as soon as it starts getting cold, just can't afford to put the heating on as well. You know, we have some of the guys that, you know, living by themselves that just don't put the heating on and spend the evenings just sat inside a sleeping bag. And um, we have people eating just, unnutritious food because you just get packets and tins which is great to have some food but the consequences of that over 30 40 years you know it takes years off people's life we, we have people that rely on donations of clothes so we have people that are grateful for clothes but wear the wrong size clothes or the wrong size shoes and and, and just the, the basics people don't have you know so it, it's it's for these reasons and much more that living in one of supposedly the richest countries in the world you know that i think 
a fair it, everyone should access to the living wage because I think that a fairer society is a better society for everyone. So thank you for the opportunity to talk. Chris, that was cracking. You were bang on time. Sorry for getting your job title wrong. I deleted my own comments on my uh, notes and couldn't get them back. Um, so um, thanks very, very much um, from everyone who's spoken. And thanks to everyone who was in the, um, everyone who spoke before. And thanks to everyone who's put questions in the chat. Um, just to acknowledge the conversation that is going on in the chat at the moment around um, like the differences and similarities between living income measures and universal basic income and basic income and all the different terminologies here. Um, there is some clarification in the chat that NEF staff have posted. There's also uh, loads more information about the, the different terminologies and how they overlap on the Living Income website and in the pamphlet that my colleague Sarah, I think, posted earlier in the chat. Um, so if people could read through those, that would be great. Um, and another thing to bear in mind is that, like Sylvia said, and like others have said in the chat, um, it's really important to us that the policies that we campaign behind uh, for are designed with the people who are campaigning for them. So some of these clarifications will be worked out in coalition um, with people who are involved in the campaign and the other organisations that we're in coalition with, like Disabled People Against Cuts. And um, so I hope that clarifies some stuff before we um, move on into the breakouts. Um, I'm going to hand over now um, to my colleague, Dan, um, who is just going to give a bit more information and clarity around the exact ways that we think a living income can be won. Um, so Dan, uh, over to you and the same rule applies uh, for you on timing. So watch my hands, please. Thanks, Becky. And good evening, everyone. Um, so we've heard from Sylvia, Chris and Ellen why living income is critical. We've heard about the research from Miata and Neff's team about the scale of the problem. And I don't know about you, but I'm really angry that we live in a country in which almost half of children don't have enough to live on. Let's be honest, that's 45% of children living below the breadline in one of the wealthiest countries in the world. But we've also heard the hope, and we all love hope, the recognition that things can be, need to be done in a different way. Leaders like Andy Burnham committing their support for the campaign and stepping up to take leadership in their regions. Local authorities, devolved governments in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and Metro mayors like Andy can campaign, speak up, run trials and lobby for action on behalf of their constituents. But we all have to remember only the UK government can implement a living income for all. We really need a national government to implement a full living income. And that means we need to see the major parties committing in their manifestos at the next general election to a living income, if not before. Let's not be under any illusions of the scale of our challenge. We all know about the toxic public opinion that has divided our country when it comes to attitudes towards social security. So we're gonna to have to shift public opinion. But the pandemic shown us that values of justice, solidarity, cooperation and love when acted on through everyday actions can be transformational and we need to harness this to win. We'll shift it through cut, cutting edge, edge research and by building a compelling narrative that reaches people's hearts and minds. Those stories need to be heard across the country, in our communities up and down the country and ringing through the halls of power in Westminster. Because it's MPs we ultimately need to reach. We need a majority of them to back it which means we need to be organized across the country, especially in some of the most strategic places where we can win this. And we're gonna to have to build the power to win it. And that means we have to build local coalitions of people and organizations who are powerful enough together to take action. It's this collective power that will ensure it's impossible for MPs and the major parties to ignore us. How do we know we can win? 
I've been organising for 15 years now, and for many years I worked on the campaign for a living wage with Citizens UK, and it's really good to see Paul Regan, uh, one of the founders of the living wage campaign, is on this call tonight. But the living wage campaign didn't start as a set of tweets or Facebook posts or even a national campaign. It began by parents, families, children and workers coming together to talk about the big pressures affecting their lives. And you know what came up time and time again across hundreds of conversations in school playgrounds, churches, mosques, trade union branches. One issue came up again and again, low pay. Parents were saying, we don't have enough time to spend with their kids because we're doing two to three jobs to make ends meet. Since then, millions of pounds have gone into the pockets of low paid workers. Football clubs like Everton and Liverpool now pay it. But it didn't start as a national campaign. It was started by people like us here tonight. It started in East London and like a beacon grew across the country from town to town and city to city. So look at what this research tells us today. In the sixth richest country in the world, 45% of children are unable to thrive. It tells us we have no choice but to build a living income campaign that ensures that no one lives below the breadline. But as individuals, we can't do this on our own. We need to build teams. We need to all organize together. And that's our first step, team building. So we want to spend the summer building living income teams across the country so that we're ready to take action together. When the cliff edge of the end of furlough and universal credit uplift hits in the autumn. So our organising team is here to support you to build teams in your local area. So tonight we're asking you for a commitment. Are you ready to become a living income leader in your area? And in return, we're making a commitment to you. We'll offer you campaign leadership training on Wednesday, the 30th of June, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. In that hour, we'll give you the training and support to help you get your local living income team started. Uh, there's a link going into the chat where you can sign up to that. Don't worry if you can't make this training. Uh, there will be others offered as well. As we build teams over the summer, we'll then move towards taking our first actions together to get ourselves heard in Parliament. So if you want to win this campaign, if you want to win a living income, we can do it, but we can only do it when we come together to organise. Thanks.